Welcome to Unpacking Peanuts, the podcast where three cartoonists take an in-depth look at the greatest comic strip of all time, Peanuts by Charles M. Schultz. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Happy New Year. Did you have a good holiday season? We did here uh, at Unpacking Peanuts, and we're more than excited to... uh, to continue this podcast into 2023 and beyond. It's 1965. The Rolling Stones are unsatisfied. The Beatles are asking for help. Lucy's being terrorized by a sentient, malevolent blanket. But there is a World War One flying ace on the scene. He's here to save the day. And I can't wait to talk about all of it with you guys. Hope you're doing well. I'm Jimmy Gownley. I'm one of your hosts for today. Uh, I'm a cartoonist as well. I'm the cartoonist behind Amelia Rules, The Dumbest Idea Ever, and Seven Good Reasons Not to Grow Up. Joining me, as always, are my pals, co-hosts, and fellow cartoonists. He's a playwright and a composer, both for the band Complicated People as well as for this very podcast. He's the original editor for Amelia Rules, the co-creator of the original comic book Price Guide, and the cartoonist behind such great strips as Strange Attractors, Tangled River, and A Gathering of Spells. It's Michael Cohen. Hey there. And he's the executive producer and writer of Mystery Science Theater 3000, a former vice president of Archie Comics, and currently the cartoonist behind the great Instagram strip, Sweetest Beasts, Harold Buckholtz. Hello. Well, guys, this is a very, very exciting year to talk about. There is a lot going on in in Schultz's mind and in his art. I think this is, I'm looking at this as like a year of big swings, where he's taken some chances and he's going off in some unique directions. I think it's going to be a, a year that we look as kind of a turning point in the in the whole arc of the strip. Harold, what are your thoughts to start us off, uh, you know, both with what your experience was reading this and also, you know, if you have any insights into Mr. Schultz or what's going on in his world? Yeah, 1965 is, is a really big year for Charles Schultz. Uh, he makes the cover of Time magazine on April 9th. I think I'd said in a previous episode that he had been on the cover of Time magazine much earlier i think that was incorrect this is this is the time he does in this it's uh entitled the world according to peanuts you get some sense of the impact that peanuts is having on american culture to make the cover of time magazine and uh eight months later on the 9th of uh december the peanuts uh Christmas special comes out, Charlie Brown Christmas, uh, and it debuts to tremendous response. And it goes on to win an Emmy and a Peabody Award for Outstanding Children's Show. So huge impact that Schultz is having uh, 15 years in to this strip. And uh, that's something that, is, you know, we can really kind of track in the strips and see see the sense of of confidence in his work uh in 1965 he just seems to be at the top of his game and that's my memory as well as a kid is uh when i would get be reading these in the 1970s i would go and look at the copyright page because they would tell you what years these strips came from uh in these faucet crest uh, mass market paperbacks that i would be reading as a little kid and uh, whenever I saw like 1964, 65 as the copyright uh, for most of the strips in that year, that was the that was the book to get because those were the ones I just loved the most. Um, in his personal life, Schultz now has two teenagers. Meredith is 15, Monty's uh-huh. 13, Craig is 12, Amy's 9, and Jill is 7. So this is a prime school years ranging at anywhere from elementary up through high school <laughs> and you know, you, I think you can see that in the strips. Um, there's lots of lots of in the weed strips about going to school and the PTA, and and you also get that sense of the old having older kids and the concerns of having uh, teenage kids in the strips. We can talk about that, I guess, as we go along. But um, there's romance starts to kind of enter into the these strips through Snoopy, and it's a really interesting year to see Schultz living with children of all different ages i think it does come out in the strips this year uh yeah i actually really agree with that there's a few instances uh in the strips that we're going to be discussing where i thought oh that has to be something that he was dealing with at home so michael what what are your thoughts on on 1965 and uh do you think we're going to have a, a any fluctuation in the the old tier list of characters uh i agree it's a pivotal year and i think 
we've getting some indications that he's going to kind of expand the peanuts world a little bit. It doesn't happen big time, but there is a character, a new character introduced who it would be the first temporary character. We'll talk about it more when we get to the strip. But since we know that the strip is going to expand into uh, the whole world of, of Marcy and Peppermint Patty sometime in the near future, we have some indications of him taking it out of the the neighborhood where so far just about everything has happened. Mm-hmm. And we we go out in, in the world a little bit. And as far as the uh, the list goes, it's pretty much status quo. The, with the A list here would be Charlie Brown, Lucy, Linus, and Snoopy, which has been consistent the whole time. These are the characters who are appear, well, at least one of them will appear in virtually every strip. And we've had a few exceptions where a strip would not have those four characters in it. And then the B list would be uh, Schroeder. I would put Frida there. And I I think we place Sally in the second tier, but she doesn't appear very much this year, not till the end of the year. She makes an impact when she does, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'd keep her in the second tier. Um, Patty and uh, Violet have looked like they've been demoted to third tier. And it's a little strange because the two of them always came came together, but it looks like Violet seems to be showing up a lot more than Patty. And then down in the basement, uh, we've got Pigpen and um, Shermie who rarely have anything to say and no real impact on their association with the other characters. They're kind of just there when he needs some people. But anyway, I'd say tier list. Let's let, I'd leave it as is for this year, but I know changes are coming soon and I'm keeping an eye on that. Yeah, and uh, it's sort of interesting. I forgot exactly how the Peppermint Patty universe opens up. And you're right, it's it's through this uh, this new character that's introduced this year. Well, while I was reading this, a couple things have changed in the way I've kind of looked at Peanuts since we started talking about it. One of the things, actually, since we started doing the tier list, is I started noticing the gaps where you don't see certain characters. You know, they don't appear for weeks at a time, sometimes months at a time, even though they're quintessential, really important Peanuts characters overall. You know, uh, Schroeder, there's not a whole lot of Schroeder going on. Like you said, Sally doesn't appear much in the the early half of the air and she comes on strong at the end. And he's also balancing this thing of playing the hits now because he has a number of hits. We have the baseball things. We have the psychiatry booth. Um, we have the kite eating tree. We have all this kind of stuff that's now getting into the pop culture that he's, he's still has to include in the strip in order to maintain that readership interest in all those things. While at the same time, he's taking big swings and going off into weird magic realism and weird fantasy elements and all this sort of stuff. But I still think he manages to keep the core of it, which is kind of amazing. And then when you think, all right, he's doing that. But he's also working on this television show, which is going to be like the greatest television episode of all time. It's astounding. And I think I have a question for Michael. Were years longer in the 60s or something? What? How can you? How do people do this type of thing? It's nuts. Yeah, I, years, I truly. Years were longer. All right. Well, that just explains so much. Yeah, you know? no, it's been, it's, been, it's been proven. Okay, good. Yeah, and I won't go into the whole Beatles things, but right, but the, you can't avoid culture that. Was, the culture was changing pretty fast, and you can think of very few people who were really steering it. And I think Schultz was one of them. Fifteen years into his career, yeah, that's you know, as a cartoonist, you would think at this point these characters would look ancient, right? They they would have some of this early fifties sort of residue and 65 is a totally different zeitgeist. It's a totally different time, but they're, they're even more relevant while being true to what they've always been. I just think that's amazing. And there's a lot of pop culture references. Yes. This year. 
Yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing which uh, obscurities Harold has has picked yeah. out. I have one myself this year. I'm very excited about it. I, this is just an unusual year because um, Michael and I picked the strips th- to discuss every year, and Michael actually picked a couple of the obscurity strips that I've uh, that I choose. Usually, those are not ones that we overlap on. And Michael's came through the first time. So I actually had a couple opportunities to add some additional obscurities because he had picked strips to talk about that I had selected as obscurity. So that's very unusual. Well, and also one of the ones you picked is one that I didn't get it. I don't, there's a reference to something I I have no memory of. Oh, wow. So when we get to that, maybe you can explain, do an explainer. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see. Actually, it may be something I know nothing about either. It's just one I thought was funny. And I, <laughs> um, as a spoiler, I'm going to make a shocking allegation. Oh, it's my gosh. A really dun, dun, shocking dun. allegation at some point. I, oh, I'm so year. excited. Yeah. So excited. Oh That's hey. why we do the podcast. Hot takes. Hot takes on 60-year-old comic strips. <laughs> Hang in there. It's coming. <laughs> So are there any other points of order? Any other things people want to discuss about this year before we get into the nitty gritty? We have, I believe, like 45 strips selected for you guys. So there's going to be a lot of it. But uh, I also want to get uh, any kind of general discussion uh, out of the way before we get into that. I was describing the circumstances that I, I had been reading most of these. Yes. I mean, I knew I read them all daily because being an old person. Uh, there was this thing called a newspaper, which was delivered every day mm, to our house. And so I, I did read them, but also I had what I thought was all the books, the original first prints of the original Peanuts collections. And I noticed last year when we were, I was reading the strips that I was not that familiar with around half of them. And I was wondering, I thought maybe I'd, missed one of the books and because i knew i read you know all the books dozens and dozens of times and there were a bunch that were unfamiliar to me going over last year's strips same on this year the first half of the year i don't remember any of these and the thing is what i think it's important is i'd been wondering how much nostalgia played into this like Mm -hmm. Did I love these so much because I read them so much when I was a kid? And I found that the first half of the year, which I had no memory of, was just as good. And that kind of shut down the nostalgia theory. And also it added a lot of suspense in some of these strips. Like, God, what's going to happen next? It's so great. Uh, This will be really the second time, third time I've kind of actually read it all the way through. But it's, there's some of these strips, it's only the second or third time I've actually read them. So they're not as ingrained as the others. And you're, you're right, when there are, there is a sequence that you're not super familiar with. It is kind of cool. It's like, ooh, this is, feels like a new one. Wow. <laughs> and there's not too much of that in, uh, in these strips, because I know Michael and I in particular had most of them memorized. But Harold, this is your era too, so. Oh, one of the things um, I I enjoy, um, I don't pick the strips generally that uh, we're going to single out and discuss. But as I read the whole year to myself, I try to predict which ones that the other guys are going to uh, going to choose. And I'm usually I, I, I have a good sense of it. I could probably guess like 80 percent of the ones they're going to pick. But that extra 20 percent when I'm really surprised, like, oh, they went with that one. That That's that's always very fun. Uh, for me yeah sometimes i won't pick one because i go this is a herald yeah strip. same same here <laughs> same here it's like you have to hold out for the other person to uh <laughs> to put it put the nominations in so that you have oh i overlap with michael on six strips so i can choose six more you know <laughs> <laughs> and then i also like uh michael sends me an entire document with just the the strips selected from uh, go comics and I just do a quick scroll through. I just switch my finger just to see how many they picked. And it's always a lot. <laughs> this is a, this year's a much less than usual. We have 45. How many do we normally do? 60. Or so. 60. <laughs> no. Well, 
<laughs> we're doing a lot of there's a lot of uh longer stories and i think that's going to happen as we go go through where there's a few sequences and we you know for copyright and whatnot we never do an entire sequence yeah. but yeah it's fun i always like to see which ones you guys pick and for for the yeah, record i i little... only pick 15 but i really respect michael's choices so i think it balances out pretty well oh good yeah and some of these long you know, two week long episodes are really great, and we're picking three to discuss. But right. I mean, if you've got uh, Go Comics, definitely go and read read the whole sequence. Right, and that is exactly what we would love for you to do. Is you know, we're we, we're trying to read the whole thing. We started in October nineteen fifteen. We're going right through to the end, and we would love your company. So if you want to, you can sign up for the Great Peanuts reread over on our website, unpackingpeanuts.com. And what that'll do is you will get a monthly email sent direct to you from us that will give you a heads up about the programming that we're doing and what strips we're going to be covering uh, in each episode. And then you could just go to gocomics.com, type in the dates of the years we're talking about, and away you go. You could read every one of these strips for free. But the best way to do that, uh, at least following along with us is to sign up for that uh, great peanuts reread at unpacking peanuts.com. So that's what I would uh, encourage you guys to do. If that's all we have in, in way of introduction, I say we get right to it because I think we're going to have a lot to say about a lot of these strips. So you guys with me? Yeah. Yep. Let's do it. All right. January 8th, Violet and Patty are sitting on little stools in front of a television set. Patty looks at Violet and says, You have very nice hands, Violet. Violet responds, Thank you. Patty says, I think nice hands are important for a girl. Patty stands up and looks disgustedly at her own hands, saying, I don't like my hands. They're too skinny. Then she asks Violet, What can you do to gain weight in your hands? Oh, no, uh, this is a momentous occasion. <laughs> well, <laughs> I picked it not because it's like the funniest strip he's ever done. But Patty and Violet, who were very important, and actually Violet, I mean, Patty was one of the first characters in the strip, have been treated badly <laughs> by Schultz lately and <laughs> sort of being relegated to, like, walk on, you know, appearances. Uh, and here Schultz, you know, 15 years into the strip, gives him a big feature. And again, it's very, very rare that there are any strips without the A-list characters. Again, Charlie Brown, Linus, Lucy, and Snoopy. And we've had, I think there was a Sally, and I think there was a Schroeder standalone. And I don't know if there's ever been a Patty and Violet standalone. And so he really felt he needed these characters for this. I don't know if the gag came first or the, or he felt he wanted something with those two in it, but here it is. And this is the very first of what you might call the the teenager strips, where it just kind of feels like something that might have been a conversation between some teenagers. I was going to say that that punchline is such a weird thing. It sounds like the kind of thing a, a, a teenage girl in the <laughs> mid sixties would say that their father might overhear and roll their eyes at. <laughs> yeah. And here we have the two nastiest characters in the Peanuts universe. Oh, right. And they're just so nice to each other. <laughs> <laughs> you have very nice hands, Violet. <laughs> if she would have complimented Charlie Brown on his hands, he would have he would have fainted dead away. <laughs> January 9th. Linus is reading the newspaper. He's concerned. He says, I can't stand it. Then, with a look of worry on his face, he gets to classic thumb and blanket position. He says to himself, this is terrible. He picks up the newspaper again. How depressing. Then he shouts to the heavens, Annette Funicello has grown up. Well, I mean, there's a point where kids realize that their people age and change. I mean, at first, they probably assume, oh, I'm a kid. I guess that's my lot in life. And it's pretty scary when you start realizing it. And and that was one of the first cases where she went from Mickey Mouse Club to being, you know, a teen surfer girl in the in these movies. Yeah, the the beach party movies and 
So this is 1965. And I guess the story goes that she was discovered by Walt Disney himself. He attended some event where she was, I think, dancing. She was very, she was like five feet, just over five feet. And she was dancing at this event and he noticed her and uh, that led to her getting an offer to audition for the Mickey Mouse Club, and which debuted, I think, in 1955. So where this is like 10 years later. And she, uh, she was the last one hired, apparently, of all of the all of the kids that they had like 24 kids that they, they uh, signed up for the Mickey mouse club, which was a daily show that was on in the afternoons and became a huge, huge success for Walt Disney company. But she, she was a standout. She was the breakout star. She, people just fell in love with Annette and she went on to be featured in a number of like, I think they, they did a little Annette uh, series and they ran her in the, the wonderful world of Disney, which had multiple different names. It's probably called Disneyland back in the day. And so she was, she was super popular in the Disney universe. And then in 1963, she was probably like 20 years old and American international pictures, which was known for some pretty schlocky films, including the, I was a teenage werewolf films we talked about in previous episode. And they wanted to work with her, but she was under contract with Disney. And surprisingly, Disney said, yeah, she can be in this beach party movie in 1963 while she was still under contract to Disney because I guess she wanted to do it and she was 20 years old. And so she went on to do a number of these with Frankie Avalon, which became really iconic movies at the time. I think his, they say his only requirement was that she had to wear like a one piece bathing suit or something so that she had some, uh, some level of Disney respectability within the American international pictures film. But she, uh, she overlapped, I think from 63 to 65 with Disney, uh, still making movies with her with things like the monkey's uncle. And <laughs> we always talk about how Schultz will change how Snoopy looks from, from, uh, pose to pose this is an absolute extreme again this is january 18th 1965 if you are not looking at a strip you may want to pull this one up to see just to what extremes charles schultz will go in changing the look of snoopy when he does a different pose for him in the first panel we've got classic mm -hmm. snoopy with an in the incredibly thick neck and the big stomach lying on the back of this doghouse by panel three literally mm -hmm. his neck is one quarter the width <laughs> of what it was in panel one and there's no stomach as he's standing right. on his head and then in panel four to put it over the gag of his him uh, kind of resting on his neck down the side of his doghouse he's about a third larger than what he he normally is it seems like he would be filling the entire doghouse if he was lying on his back in that one so he's really he's all over the map here in terms of the 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 size and the shape of snoopy yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But it works yep. as a reading experience to go right, right through it. I I always like to see a lot of black in a peanut strip just because it's so rare. Um, looks good. And speaking of night strips, that brings us to January 25th. It's a full moon on a dark night and Snoopy is down at a skating pond. He's doing a little late night skating. He thinks to himself, every night I come down here and skate around, hoping to meet a beautiful girl beagle. But it looks like I'm, suddenly he is brought up short in his skating. He looks off panel and thinks to himself, good grief, there she is. Uh, so this is the beginning of a long sequence of Snoopy and his uh, beautiful girl beagle skater. I wanted to see her. Really <laughs> how about you harold this is uh, schultz does this sometimes again this is one of those oddball things about about schultz that and you just you just roll with it when you're reading it that snoopy decides that the place to go to meet a girl beagle is at is at, <laughs> it's on the ice <laughs> skating at night that's the way he's going to find a girl beagle and he does yeah and met an ice rink a frozen pond out in the middle of the tundra it looks like. yeah it's like like it's like schultz is like i don't know it's it's weird like you talk about schultz being a a, a character in his own strip the the, the totally implausible thing that's that schultz sets up for snoopy longing for something and then he fulfills the longing it's like he produces the girl beagle who should never have shown up given the setup right so it continues. 
January 27th, Snoopy is lying atop his dog house. It's now day. It's a snowy day, worth noting that it's we're in the depths of winter. Charlie Brown comes out to him and says, Answer me truthfully, Snoopy. Have you been down to the rink skating with a girl beagle? Snoopy rolls over in his stomach, then contemplates the question while he thinks to himself, Have I been down to the rink skating with a girl beagle? That's a good question. Have I been down to the rink skating with a girl beagle? Then in the last panel, his ears are perked up, a huge smile on his face, and he thinks to himself, Wow, have I ever... And Charlie Brown rolls his eyes and says, oh, no. You got to imagine this strip, since Charlie Brown does not hear Snoopy. Mm -hmm. If Schultz had decided early on that Snoopy, we would not hear his thoughts. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Brown would not hear his thoughts. Imagine this strip without the Snoopy dialogue there. (laughs) Is Is it understandable? I think so. I mean, maybe not why he waits so long to respond. Yeah, right. Yeah, it, but I would say you definitely can tell, obviously, from Snoopy's demeanor. He's now walking on his hind legs. His ears are perked up like a rabbit's, the big goofy grin on his face. That That's an affirmative <laughs> to Charlie Brown's question. And it's also, again, this, this Schultzian logic where you've got Charlie Brown trying to get the straight scoop from snoopy of whether he's been out at night not only out at night and not only out at night skating but out at night skating with a girl beagle i don't know if he's heard the word from (laughs) shermy who was walking by that this is happening we don't know exactly how charlie brown has heard about this and the other thing that really stands out to me is that charlie brown is talking about calling this this pond a rink and You know, Schultz is a transplanted Minnesotan, loved skating, loved hockey and all that stuff. And he's now in Santa Rosa area in California. And he's four years out from having built the skating rink that is still, I think, around to this day um, because they didn't really have one. And so he was he built this beautiful skating rink in 1969. But given how long it takes to get stuff like that done, I wouldn't be at all surprised if this is around the time he's first started thinking about, Hey, I need a place to be able to skate and the community needs something like this. And so the, re- the, the that he calls it a rink, I think is really interesting. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Hey, uh, and how old did you say Meredith was? Uh, Meredith is 15. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. And listen, uh, Meredith, if you're listening, uh, no shame. I got into all kinds of shenanigans. That's perfect sneaking out at night uh, age bracket. So all good. <laughs> oh, and I do I, I do want to also mention the first two months of the strips in 1965. The thing that struck me, we haven't hit the school ones yet, but there are 10 school strips in the first two months. And there are 25 strips about growing up or romance, 25 out of about 60 strips. That is amazing. It's 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 the Snoopy meeting the girl. It's Annette Funicello. It's you know all this teenage stuff is is kind of coming in. This that vibe is just all over the beginning of this year. And what's really interesting about it is when people say like, "Did you get ideas from your kids, or do you get ideas from?" I mean, it's kind of in a way truthful to say, "Well, no," in the sense that none of these things happened. None of his kids were sneaking out to a. <laughs> a weird pond to meet a girl beagle, <laughs> right? But but you're just marinating in all this life that's going on around you. Yeah. And you have this one creative outlet that everything is getting funneled to and it's happening every single day. There's no way to avoid having all of that stuff go into it. But there's like good ways and bad ways to do it, you know? And I think like this is a great way to bring in all that teenage youthful energy, I think, it, while still, you know, maintaining the privacy and the dignity of the kids. Exactly. They're never, you know. Exactly. Yeah. The, that the right answer, if 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 there's an honest way to answer it, is no. You know, there there is. You know, I'm not taking this from the lives of these right. people because then it'll inspire people like me <laughs> to go and guess which things were based on what. 
And that's right. that that really does take you into places sometimes you don't want to go. And I, you know, I, I get that. That's that is the correct answer. And just for everybody to be remember, and Seb- they're in Sebastopol on this beautiful multi acre campus that Joyce has continually been building out as as a play place for the kids, essentially. And a, as you might expect, that means that there were a lot of kids, not just the five kids that they had, but a lot of their friends were coming out to to play on, you know, they've got a little golf three what three whole golf course they've got tennis courts they've got i mean it's 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 nice and so you can imagine what schultz is surrounded by in this world that, that he and joyce have created yeah and you know the other thing i'd just like to say to the for these kids uh, to grow up in that kind of luxury at that period of time and all turn out to be decent you know kind cool people it seems from every report you get yeah. is not only a testament to them but it's a testament to their parents and their step parents uh that it worked out because a lot of a lot of stories of privilege of that type it doesn't work out quite as well but in peanuts land the story is continuing and that was uh the 27th of january we're now all the way up at february 4th snoopy is out at night again still a full moon by the way so I'm not sure how that's <laughs> happening <laughs> <laughs> what planet is this? <laughs> and Snoopy says, well, it's definitely a different planet because the gravity is different because Snoopy's well off the ground as he's walking. To he's in love. Yeah. <laughs> he thinks to exactly. He thinks to himself, I've never been so nervous in all my life. He continues to think as he races for the pond. Tonight, I'm going to ask my little beagle friend to marry me. He skates out onto the pond. He thinks to himself, we'll skate through life together. Then he looks directly out at us with a ridiculous grin on his face, wearing a giant stocking cap. And he says, wish me luck. This one bothers me a little. All right. I mean, it's the breaking the fourth wall. And uh, this, to me, this is not, this is not a good strip. Uh, to me, it feels like a, 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 uh, marking time and building the idea of that this is an event like almost like giving it an extra day so people could talk about it or something like that uh-huh. like to hear snoopy's getting married but as yeah i, I know what you're saying i definitely i'm, I'm yeah. a huge fan of breaking the fourth wall when it's done well and and here oh i, I love too. snoopy so much that i i'm delight that he's asking me to wish him luck because i'm wishing him luck <laughs> Well, if there, you know, there, I've destroyed the fourth wall. I mean, I, uh, so I, I have no problem with that so much as maybe it just feels like it's a beat too long within the story. Uh, but I would really encourage everybody to read this entire story, you know, because it also involves Charlie Brown giving his permission to Snoopy to marry this girl beagle. But there's also a moment where Charlie Brown says something like, oh, my dog's finally cracked up. And you think, wait, is Snoopy hallucinating this girl beagle? It's just a very, very odd, odd story. And we have not chosen, (laughs) because (laughs) that's us, we have not chosen to cover the actual strip where we find out the resolution. So does anyone want to tell us, does Snoopy get married? Yeah. Well, first, Michael, I just wanted to ask, like, going back to the breaking the fourth wall, do you just like to see a world that's self-contained and does not, you know, does not include the reader? Um, like, like, do you, do you mind like Oliver Hardy looking at, looking at us at the screen and during a Laurel and Hardy, or is it just a, I just was wondering like where, where you're coming from as to uh, what you well, like. Well, I am actually not a big Laurel and Hardy fan. No, I have no problem. I mean, Jimmy, you know, I mean, he breaks the fourth wall all the time. I've, sort of done it but not very much it's i don't know it's just that it's kind of a teaser right that's a good way to put it how do you, you mean know, a it's teaser? like a, a little bit of a cliffhanger like you want to find out what happens <laughs> okay so basically it's putting off moving it forward right right but but having said that like if i was not analyzing this for a peanuts podcast and was just reading it in the newspaper you know, I'd be on the edge of my seat to see what's happening. And the drawing of Snoopy in that last panel is about as cute a drawing. He so rarely gives us that Snoopy looking directly at us view. And yeah, and he's so and he's so, so effective. Open, you know, he's he's yeah. so open. You know, he's vulnerable. You know, right. your your you know your heart kind of goes out to this Snoopy. He's he's put all of his he's he's not being guarded or or cynical or selfish or it's just this open 
he's been touched by love, you know, and it's pretty cool to see. And, you know, the meta narrative, because we're familiar with peanuts and how things work, we kind of know how it's going to work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is to say it's not going to work. Yeah. Well, this I had not. This is one of the strips I'd never seen before. And when I got to these and I'm reading them and, you know, it's like two weeks worth. I was really going to wondering, is he going to show the, the girl yeah, Beagle? Yeah. Because I had no memory of this. And, and Jimmy, you mentioned the thing about the full moon. It, mm-hmm. When you read these, do you kind of get the feeling that, uh, it, without it saying otherwise, that if you're going from day to day, it actually is a new day in the Peanuts world if you're reading a, in the strip the next following day? Well, you know, I don't have the entire sequence in front of me, but obviously when it's like switching day to night, it has to be a new day there. If there's a couple sequences of days in a row or nights in a row that those could be moment to moment, but clearly like, you know, let's say we looked at one twenty five, it's night one twenty seven, it's day. Charlie Brown has says, you know, have you been down to the rink skating with the girl beagle? So, yeah, I mean, so it should be waning gibbous is what you're saying. In this that's what I'm saying. And basically I've given up any hope of, of, of making any sense of this comic strip at this point. It could be a balloon. <laughs> it's a weather balloon. They always say it is. Or a UFO. It, actually, I think it, the answer is it's always a full moon in comic strips, unless you're in like crazy cat. If you're going to draw a moon, you might as well draw the big full moon oh, and get the nice value. I, for some reason, I'm a crescent guy because I can't draw a good circle. <laughs> <laughs> I draw a lot of crescents as well. But, of course, it doesn't work out for Snoopy. And here we are on February 9th. Patty comes up to Charlie Brown and says, You say Snoopy is eating to forget his broken romance? Patty continues, That sounds like a good idea. Charlie Brown says to Patty, It has its drawbacks. Then in the last panel, we see Snoopy atop his doghouse. His stomach is swollen (laughs) to twice the size of his head. And he looks more than a little upset. Yeah, that's a great little picture of little fatty snoopy there (laughs) it really is those tiny little back paws oh yeah poor little snoopy so i want to ask you about patty michael so so patty is clearly taller than charlie brown here so is that always been established that she's yeah well he's or he came in as the kid he was younger right yeah so so that is that's so she's kind of is she younger than shermie you think uh but older than charlie brown I think there was like a year difference, which at the time was a big deal because he was definitely a kid. And Schultz just kind of always maintained those height relationships. And I think Charlie Brown at this year, there's a strip where he's talking to Lucy, I think at the, at the psychiatry booth. And is it something like she's saying something has to happen by the age of five. And he says, I'm much older than five. So, we got a hint that maybe he's six or seven now. I think six. Yeah, he doesn't say much older. He just says older. It's, uh, you know, your your personality traits are all set by the time you're five. And he says, but I'm already five. In fact, I'm older than five. And my other Patty question is, why why is he using Patty here for this conversation with Charlie Brown? I think it's guilt. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be guilt. I, I was, was like, she was... In the the first couple of strips, she was like she's the, the first, second person to speak. In yeah, the, the first yeah. girl in the strip, she was a very important character, and he's he's obviously uh, feeling like oh god. <laughs> <laughs> my my thought was, I was like, I need a character who is going to ask a question, but I don't want the audience to think about what they would think about the response from Charlie Brown. So it has to be somebody we don't know. Yeah. So I'm going to use Patty. That was my thing. Well, it's a perfect Shermie setup, and I'm surprised right. he didn't do it. Uh, which is is it, you know it brings us to sad news. We do not have a Shermie strip to cover this year. Oh, it, it's just terrible. Uh, you know, but we may by the end of it still still check the Shermometer just to just to check in on him because I can't let go of it that easily. But <laughs> but no Shermie this year. Well, he will be in two strips, but. Just as one of the gang. <laughs> as the bystander. One of the gang. February 13th. Lucy is hanging out at Schroeder's piano. And Schroeder's plinking away. Lucy says to him, tomorrow is Valentine's Day. Then she turns. 
a big smile on her face as she rests her elbows on the piano and says, are you going to give me a valentine? Schroeder immediately goes back to practicing and says, I never have. What makes you think I'll give you one this year? Lucy shouts as loud as she can, Hope! This is a classic strip of, of all of the the uh, Schroeder Lucy strips at the piano. This is this is one I remember really well, and I I just <laughs> I love because Lucy is uh, you know she's in a good mood all the way through. She's she's not at all uh, deflated by what Schroeder says, and it's just again it's interesting to see once again this is one of the growing up romance strips uh, of the. <laughs> of the first two months that is just so common in these strips. I really like the expression on Lucy's face in the last panel where yeah. she's clearly is hopeful. Yeah. You know? uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's great. It's really, really cute. And this is Lucy at her most vulnerable is always in front of Schroeder. So it's, it's, it's good to see that side of Lucy. I think it, it really softens our opinion of her to see that mm-hmm. there's somebody that she, somebody that she would love to have a connection with that she's, she's not getting. You're really starting to see how rubbery and abstract the figures are. Like when you look at Lucy's arms in that third panel, you know, it's almost, it's just a tighter, like Thurber arm almost, <laughs> you know, there's no defined elbows. They're all just curves. looks really good, really sharp, very modern drawing. Yeah. And it's one of the few times where it looks like maybe we've got the, the, the four finger animation hand instead of the five finger hand, which she usually shows. I think that's the pointer finger. No, I don't know. What's that? I thought the, oh, well, yeah, but actually in the last panel, yeah, I guess you can see it that way. Interesting. February 21st. It's a Sunday. Snoopy is atop his doghouse. He thinks to himself, I feel strange. He jumps off the doghouse and thinks to himself, I feel very loving today. I think I'll kiss somebody on the cheek. That's not a great impulse to act on Snoopy, but he does. He goes up and he kisses Lucy on the cheek, who is just sitting there reading a book. She looks shocked. She shouts to the heavens, Og, somebody get me some soap and water. I've just been kissed by a dog. Now Lucy is standing up, running around and ranting. Get hot water. Get some disinfectant. Get some iodine. Snoopy (laughs) thinks to himself, good grief, then goes back to the top of his doghouse and says, next time I'll bite her on the leg. So Harold, is this one of the romance comic? It, was it is. Talking about? Yeah, <laughs> things are getting all smoochy and lovey dovey all through these these opening uh, uh, months. Of hashtag peanuts. consent, Snoopy. Hashtag consent. <laughs> wow. No, oh, that's yeah. There's a there's a dog for you, boy. They're just gonna just go for the smooching. Okay, so here's a weird thing. Yeah, and this I always is want... weird. Oh, you're... oh no. Go ahead. What's your? You weird have a thing? different. Well, the next strip is <laughs> thematically. Yeah, that is weird. What I was just going to say is that suddenly it's summer again. Mm -hmm. There's there's full on hedges that seem uh, that they've never been covered by snow. There's leaves on the tree. Uh, And I wonder when he makes the decision to do stuff like that, to be like, all right. I mean, the last sequence that we've studied with the, um, the little girl beagles, all based on the fact that it's the dead of winter. And now it's like two weeks later and suddenly it. It looks like it's the middle of June. Yeah, hey, it's Cal- California, man. He, he's, oh, that's right. I guess he's totally Hennepin County, bouncing, California. He's, <laughs> he's bouncing back and forth, uh, and we we see later we see some things that could not have happened in Hennepin County, um, for sure. So yeah. it's interesting that yeah, Schultz, he's going back from his childhood memories in Minnesota, and then he's popping back into his life in California, and you know, it's I, the, I buy it as a, I buy it Hennep- as a reader. It's the Hennepin County of the mind. Yes. Oh, this is also a famous sequence from um, from the Christmas special, which from uh, the Christmas special, you know, yes. they would have written probably just about I don't know about five months or so after he created this. So, um, so this one was on his mind and and is a very funny one and works incredibly well in the animated special. It's one of the classic many classic sequences in the Christmas special. Is it's Lucy running around? Going nuts after being smooched by uh, by Snoopy. Very cute, and like Michael says, thematically attached uh, daily strip here on February twenty fifth. Lucy sticks her tongue out at Snoopy, says "bleh," 
Snoopy sticks his tongue back out, saying, Bleh. They both do it at the same time in panel two. Bleh, bleh. Only this time their tongues touch. Then Lucy goes running around like a lunatic again, saying, Og, our tongues touched. My tongue touched the tongue of a dog. I'm poisoned. In the last panel, Snoopy is sitting there with his <laughs> tongue out. And he thinks to himself, bleh, I feel a little nauseated myself. <laughs> Ew, I feel <laughs> nauseated just thinking about this. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the the, the the Lucy Jean Simmons panel. <laughs> oh, <was> so creepy. <laughs> Have we talked about the time I met Jean Simmons on the show? I don't think so. <laughs> Jesus. So, we, oh, Michael, you were there. No, I wasn't. Oh, did he uh, go to a con? Yeah, yes. It was the maybe you weren't there when he popped by, but you were at the convention. It was the very first time we exhibited out in San Diego. And Amelia, we only had one issue of Amelia out and one issue of the Forbidden Book out. We had a booth in San Diego Comic Con. And um, I was like so nervous. I'd never even been to the convention before. I wanted to put my best foot forward. Suddenly, some kid who I'm talking to, right go uh, he just stops our conve- our conversation he goes gene simmons and there's gene simmons from kiss and he comes over like oh man oh you're my favorite i love kiss and this is before there were cameras on your phone so he's like can you take a picture with me and it's, sure sure so gene simmons takes all his crap that he's carrying and throws it on top of all my books i'm trying to sell <laughs> and then him and this knucklehead are standing in front of my booth getting their picture taken and someone in front of them is taking the picture and all. And if anyone out there is listening (laughs) and if you can find this picture, because somewhere out there is this kid with his arm around Gene Simmons and they're both smiling and there's me in the background, giving them both the finger. (laughs) So if anyone can find that, send it to uh, unpacking peanuts. (laughs) That's, that's called putting your best foot in your mouth. (laughs) <laughs> your best tongue in your mouth <laughs> i just love that some he's like i can't wait to get that gene simmons picture back because you had to get a you know developed back in those days yeah <laughs> well try a google image search it's probably on it's probably on etsy as a 20 by 24 print <laughs> <laughs> i would buy that i bet you would. <laughs> march 4th linus and charlie brand are outside linus is looking at some piece of paper in his hand and he says well I'll be he continues to look at the piece of paper he looks very concerned and he says to Charlie Brown I guess I'm going to have to get on the ball look at this he hands the paper to Charlie Brown then he says I'm the only person I know who got a cinch notice for lunch eating okay I have no idea what this is all about well that makes this a peanuts obscurity peanuts obscurity is playing all right, very exciting. Okay. Hit us with it, Harold. Here we go. So the cinch notice is from everything I could find out online, which is not much, it is a term that it was just used only, and people can correct me you listening if I'm wrong, seemed to only be used in the general San Francisco area. <laughs> and it was a ter- but I think Schultz didn't know that when he wrote this joke. So looking into this, I was trying to find, of course, whenever you do the search for this thing and you type in cinch notice, what comes up first? A peanuts. <laughs> peanuts. That's exactly what I did when I, cause I didn't know what it was either. But looking into it a little bit further, I found this really interesting, r- tiny article in this, the Stanford daily of the Stanford university, which is again, just outside of San Francisco. It's, it's about an hour's drive from Sebastopol. And it's it, this is from November 25th, 1933. It says the scholarship committee reports that a large number of students have received smoke-ups. There were 372 of them sent to as many unfortunate people and 42 even more unlucky individuals uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, made the big splurge of earning two or more smoke-ups apiece. What but, is that? But the... <laughs> But this, but it, it's it's like with the headline of this thing of cinch notices. So apparently, there is this thing going on in school in this area that you're being given some sort of a note. And I, I you know, when you think of cinch, I can only guess at what this means. But I'm guessing it's like you got to tighten, you got to tighten your belt, mm-hmm. 
you got to get your act together is what this is supposed to mean. So you would be getting a note from the the school saying, here's a warning. You're not going to be doing well if you don't get do better in school. And they, everybody has those. We just called them failure warnings or failure notices. Yeah. So it's like to, to, to buckle down or whatever, to, right. to cinch. And uh, I did find as recent a reference in the um, Mission Valley Regional uh, <laughs> Occupational School in their program. In 2010, there was a faculty handbook where it talked about how you had to provide a cinch notice if you were going to fail a student, you had to give them warning. So it was this weird thing. And again, that's like near San Jose, right in the same mm-hmm. spot, right where Schultz is living. He just happens to get what sounds like a, again, it's a great term. And I'm assuming, you know, Schultz mm-hmm. is saying, well, this must be a thing right now. And it's all over the country. And it just happened yeah. to be in this tiny little pocket. Well, I was, I was going to school in California at this time. I'd never heard it. Yeah, I think it's so it's super it, low. That was in low. L.A. Yeah, but you know what? He again, he, it is a great term, and he knows it's going to sound great in a comic strip. Li- he can imagine Linus saying it. You know, it's just that in this instance, nobody uh, knew what he was talking about. But he used the unnecessary quotation marks, which, which I am a huge fan of. So, when you read this, did that idea come across that you pretty much get that it's it's some sort of a, or is it just completely like, oh, I have no idea what this strip is about? I don't really remember this from being from being a kid so i probably would have if i did see it i just glossed over it and then this time reading it i looked it up probably was not reprinted (laughs) probably (laughs) yeah maybe he learned that it was super local march 17th linus is standing in his living room in classic thumb and blanket position lucy is looking on she's scowling and upset she says now look here In in panel two, she's yelling at Linus saying, when you're not around, you keep that blanket locked up in your room. Do you hear me? It's a menace. It hates me. In the third panel, Linus is standing in front of the closet door and says, okay, how's that? And in the last panel, we see the blanket sneaking out from underneath the locked closet door. It's the blob. Yeah, I love he's doing a horror strip (laughs) for these few... This ran for a while. Actually, this, you, you know, we're coming well, in in the middle. Yeah, this right. blanket turns in. I mean, for good reason, hates Lucy. Well, Michael, give us the whole setup of what this sequence is about. Well, Harold mentioned it's the blob, which was one of the most popular horror flicks. But in the context of these strips, what is happening with the blanket and Lucy and everything? It's it, it's sentient. The blanket hates Lucy. And it's a, it's turned into some kind of horror creature. The fact that you like this blows my mind, blows my mind. I was listening. I was reading these last night and thinking, oh, my God, Michael must hate these strips. And we're just going to talk about how terrible they are. I can't believe you like it. Harold, what are your thoughts about these? I remember this as a kid and I remember, boy, this this had a huge impact because, yeah, it is this creeping, crawling thing that does not like Lucy. And she's genuinely frightened by this thing. Yeah. It is. This reminds me there was a Dick Van Dyke episode that was a horror episode. Walnuts. Yeah. The, um, the walnuts, right. Where uh, there, there people are being like body snatched by the aliens and only eating walnuts or something like that. I'm looking at you. (laughs) Yes, that's right. (laughs) Eyes are in the back of their heads. Yes. Yeah, Yeah. So no, it, I would like to know why the blanket lost its sentience later. <laughs> I have no problem with the blanket being an, a character. So you don't you don't mind it get gaining sentience. You just want to understand why it's lost it, or why mm-hmm. it was just ignored afterwards. I, I want I need reasons yeah. here. All right. Well, this is my take on it. Quentin Tarantino. You might. I think this is obvious from reading Amelia, but one of my huge influences is Quentin Tarantino, and. I uh, was listening to an interview with him where he's talking about Brian De Palma, who's his favorite director, and they're talking about Bonfire of the Vanities. And he says, only a truly great artist could go that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I feel about this sequence. Like, I th- this was nuts to me. This whole thing I don't get, I think is weird. I'm so glad it never came back. Larry Ruttman hated it at the syndicate. He called it monster stuff. <laughs> uh weird and it's so but I, but it's so worth talking about a, a because 
I'm totally fascinated that you liked it. I think that's so cool. And B, I want to know, you only become a great artist by risking huge failure. Like to be a great artist is to constantly be courting failure because you're constantly pushing at the edge of what you can do. It it doesn't matter what, if you're just doing something that's very cute, but you're pushing to the absolute edge of cuteness, that's a risk. If you do something that's violent and you're pushing the violence, that's a risk. You're going to get to a part where you start maybe alienating some people, but you got to do it because you don't know if you don't explore, you're not going to find what fruitful stuff uh, there is to find. And this fantasy stuff for Schultz does pay off in huge ways later. Yeah. And it's really interesting to see how Schultz deals with this character. Cause it, it does remind me of, of the, these horror films. I mean, mainly, mainly I think of like horror and sci-fi films of the fifties where essentially their, their morality plays um, sometimes in disguise and sometimes not at all in disguise where you have somebody getting a comeuppance through some, you know, through some, some means that is, is absolutely out of, out of people's control. And what you see in this strip is you, in this series of strips is that this, you know, we know Lucy's not been kind to Linus. She's been rough on Linus. And it's like Schultz can't have Linus get, get the come up. And so he creates something that's already in the world and imbues it with this power that is taking on Lucy and essentially all it's vengeance to me. The way I read it is it's vengeance for Linus where Linus himself would not do the vengeance. And so, yeah. and what uh-huh. you see in the strips, and I think this is what makes it work for those that it does work for. And these totally worked for me as a kid. I, because you know, as a kid in particular, I was just accepting peanuts for peanuts. I wasn't saying, well, that doesn't work here or that I wasn't right. in that space. I was just experiencing peanuts. And because this was happening, that was part of the world. And it was genuinely frightening, but it, it was in the sense like this, this blanket was after her because Lucy is Lucy toward Linus. And to see, and the thing that makes it work for me is look at how Linus responds. If Linus were like, hey, this is my blanket, <laughs> right. and in my blanket's going to meet justice for me, he doesn't do that. He's he's just as almost as frightened as Lucy is, even though he's not the one being attacked. The classic Linus hair just going straight out in the air we see over and over again in these strips. He's genuinely, genuinely shocked by this thing. And yet, well, the weird thing is he's shocked by it, but... It's it's not like he's trying to get rid of it. It's still it's his blanket. It's this really weird dynamic. But if if Linus was into this thing, I think it would just totally turn everybody against it. But the fact that Linus himself, the thing he's attached to, it's like this extension of himself is somehow his id is coming out and and attacking Lucy is you know and you can read it that way or you, or you don't have to. But yeah. that to me is kind of well, what makes it work for those that it would work for. Well, a security guard would attack people who attack you. So I guess a security blanket should be doing the same. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, that, yeah. yeah, I'd like to see this as a graphic novel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, starting with, you know, the blanket being exposed to an atomic bomb test. <laughs> or gamma rays or something. No, well, it's a great it's a great little story. Well, you know, the way it does work for what you're saying is like why it gains and loses sentience. It does go back to my meta theory that and what Harold is saying. It it does because Charles Schultz says it can for this little period of time and then it just stops. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like it's, and that's it's the, done what it needs to do. And, and so yeah. now it can go back to what is normal. And that is so sci fi of the 50s and early 60s. Yeah. Now, I do have a question about the blanket. So, yeah it o- is it always the same blanket well it can't be and yet it is uh because like schultz and has talked about this actually in interviews where it's been set on fire it got been cut up it's been turned into a flannel graph it's been all these things have happened it's, you know been quilted and you know and yet it's the blanket all the time somehow it's like the looney tunes thing you know right where like why the coyote gets smashed, but in the neck is just a hard cut, and then he's back. Yeah, like Snoopy yeah. getting fat from his romance, and then right. you know, t- two panels later, he's back to his normal self. Yeah, right. So I mean, 
because he could always go get some outing flannel and make another one, but it's always the blanket. Yeah. The blanket. Yeah. Did they ever market? Did they ever market the blanket? Did anyone ever try to actually license? Yeah, the I have one. I oh, I have a, <laughs> yeah, I have one. And you're, of course you're, I do. You're sucking your thumb right now. And... Right now, yes, yes. <laughs> you can, it's it's a blue blanket. It's a light blue minus security blanket, and it has a tiny little applique linus. Is and it, it was packaged as the security blanket. Is it, was it, outing, thing? Thing? Is it outing flannel though? That's I did not check that. You know, if it's not, I'm throwing it out tonight. <laughs> yeah, but, is, uh, is this a recent license thing, or is this like a classic uh, years ago? Thing? No, I mean it's the, I, someone got it for me when I was an adult. Wow. So, I mean, you know. Yeah. Wow. Well, it makes sense. You know, I'd never seen yeah. one, but I, I just seemed like it should exist in the world. Oh, I thought you meant it makes sense for someone to give me a blanket to help aid my mental health because <laughs> that that also makes a lot of sense. So it's not working. So it's probably not outing flannel. Oh, there you go. You know what? I think we've exposed a, yet another racket <laughs> does, today. It's late. Does the packaging period. say now with sentience? Yeah, right. <laughs> Actually, I can't find it. Maybe it ran away. It's in the closet. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Be nice to your dog. Oh, you didn't you read. Want... You didn't read these. No, I didn't. But do you want me? We can read them now. You sure, yeah, they're can... great. All right, March twenty second. Lucy is in her house and she's sort of yelling to the general house. Mom, are you home? Mom, Dad, anybody home? She enters. I guess the living room because we see a cool lamp on the table and she yells even louder. Linus, are you home? Isn't anybody home? Where is everybody? Then in panel three, she looks very worried and she says to herself, don't tell me I'm all alone in this house with that. And in the last panel, it creeps towards her. Blanket. Then we have uh, March 25th. Linus is in classic thumb and blanket position. Lucy is watching him. He's She's annoyed by this. And she says, I hate that blanket and it hates me. If I get just half a chance, I'm going to throw that thing in the trash burner. In panel three, the blanket leaps from Linus's arms, making what appears to be a giant gaping mouth who screams, Ugh! Then in panel four, it's a brawl between Lucy and the blanket. Get it off me. Get it off me. Linus is yelling, down, boy, down. <laughs> that picture of the blanket jumping at lucy as if it's a gigantic open mouth boy is that indelibly printed in my memory from childhood that that was a big deal (laughs) in peanuts reading that seeing this thing attacking lucy uh is it's just you don't you don't forget that after reading it brilliant he does this so well it's like it's a blanket but it's also a monster with a giant mouth attacking a kid and he just seems to it's the only time anyone in human history is going to need to draw this (laughs) (laughs) but he has the perfect icon to do it yeah i did want to ask you guys how are you on your speedball lettering pen point knowledge oh not very good the this year he switches over and he, he goes back and forth. He was usually using, I think, a, a is it a C nib, C3 which, which is a, a, his... a circular uh, nib yeah. point, which he would use for with the bolds. And what is he using for, usually for his general lettering? I think it's like a B or something. I don't know. Because in the second panel on the March 25th, he switched over. You can, if you look yeah. at the 22nd, uh, the second panel, he's using the bold circular pen point which i think is the b and now he's switched over to something else it almost looks like a magic marker to me but it's it's yeah it's probably a, a d or something i don't know because there's the, the different points there's one that's like a almost like a straight line nib there's another one that's a square there's one that's circular and there's one that's oblong i think the oblong's d the circular's b and i i the i think the a might be the one that's like a chisel tip like a calligraphy tip and Anyway, he's he's switched over to this other one, which I don't like as much. And I didn't think about it Mm-mm. at all. Again, you know, growing up, it was just it was peanuts. But now as a cartoonist, I look at that and I'm like it. it For some reason, it looks like he's just gotten out a magic marker <laughs> some, and, and using that lettering. For our listeners, for what Harold's describing as a certain roundness, if you look at, let's say, the L in Linus in panel two on the 22nd and you see where the the strokes start and stop at the top of the L and the right side of the lower, you know, cross section of the L. You can see that 
it's rounded. Whereas if you look at the L or, you know, something in the, the 25th strip panel two, it has a more uh, abrupt end to the stroke. And you can tell that that's a different type of nib. But then if you see if by the time he goes to the fourth panel of the 25th, it seems like it's back to the rounded nib. Again. Yeah, yeah. This is unrelated, but it's uh, uh, since we're talking about lettering, I'm, I want to bring up something we've discussed in the past. I believe I have a no prize for um, good old Windsor McKay to explain his his crazy lettering. Ooh, they lay it on okay. us. So we were talking and we were we were mentioning that Windsor McKay is one of the most, if not the most brilliant draftsmen who ever lived in the, and worked in comics. Gorgeous, gorgeous artwork. However, the lettering was always spindly, crooked. It, it never even stayed on the same line. It would sometimes curve up to 90 degrees and, and you know, morph around the shape of the word balloon. But I have a reason. I, I, if we assume he is a genius in all other ways and we want to think that, hey, maybe he planned this out too. All of Little Nemo takes place in dreams, right? Yeah. And in a dream, you can meet a 20 story elephant and you could travel to fairy and you can fly. But you know what you can't do? Read. You cannot read in a dream. You cannot read the lettering in Little Nemo. It makes perfect conceptual sense. He's a genius across the board. And so are you for noticing that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that is one of the great mysteries of, of cartooning. Is, is that was was i'm so sorry <laughs> you didn't mean to in any way suggest that was not the definitive explanation <laughs> that's it case closed conversation ended march 28th snoopy is outside he looks in anguish his fists are clenched as he thinks to himself what a stupid thing to do in panel two we see him up on his hind legs looking in the grass looking very upset he says, why do things like this happen to me? In panel three, we see he's still staring at the grass. Linus is also down on his hands and knees rummaging through the grass. Snoopy thinks to himself, this is hopeless. Linus says, we got to keep looking, Snoopy. In the next panel, they're both still wandering around in this little field looking at the grass. Snoopy says, rats. Still looking in the grass, Snoopy says, I'm almost at the point of despair. And he looks it too. In the next panel, though, Linus looks happy. He's down on all fours, and he says to him, Snoopy, I found them, Snoopy, I found them. Then he holds seemingly empty hands up to Snoopy and says, Here you are. Snoopy runs over saying, Wow, I can't believe it. And he clutches whatever they are to his chest and says, Boy, what a relief. I'm lost without my contact lenses. Okay. I mentioned at the beginning of the show I had a shocking allegation. Ooh. Yes. And uh, I'm about to reveal what that shocking allegation is. There okay. is something seriously wrong with panel five. That is not Charles Schultz. That I was just <laughs> thinking about that that panel. That to me is the first time we see Snoopy look like this. And interestingly to your theory, that reminds me so much of certain looks I remember from this the animated specials. It's like a, you didn't see it in the strip, but you would see it. I, it's, I have memories from the specials uh, of Snoopy looking like this. So I don't know if, if that sounds totally I crazy. I would but... think that something happened. He sent the strip in, someone spilled ink, and they said, <laughs> okay, we got to go to press here. To, to me, it's, it's it's totally Schultz, but it's, it's a new version of Snoopy we have never seen before. It's really klutzy. And uh, to add to that, panel three. There's something seriously wrong with the with the perspective. Well, I, that's kind of what Linus I love about this strip is that is it's too high. Even if it's like a he's up on the up on a where where's the viewer? Where's the horizon line? It's just it's I've never seen two panels in a peanuts that look so wrong. <laughs> Are you talking about panel four and panel five? No, three and five. Oh, three and five. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying with three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the house is way like we've always seen the neighborhood is flat, and but the house is way down a hill. Yeah, I think part of this might be might be from the fact that he is. This is actually primarily a visual strip, but as you could tell by me even describing it, 
it's a visual strip where nothing is happening. It's people looking at something in the grass. I think he's trying to show ways uh, that make it interesting from panel to panel and maybe hide the fact that we're going to find out that they're looking for contact lenses or whatever. He, he never but I think that whole, like this. that whole middle, but it's definitely him. I I'm certain it's him panel because five? of that incline panel. Five? Yeah. All of it. That oh, does yeah, yeah. not look like a dog. Well, what do you think of panel two? Panel two is, is a, is, fine. is a unique and odd drawing of Snoopy. I think with, he's got, he's, he's a little fatter as he's leaned over with his arm in the middle of this. Of the, yeah. The body I mean, here. and, uh, I mean, definitely the last two panels are just well, that's, clearly Schultz totally on model. I think something went wrong on that middle tier. I, I actually love the strip because Schultz is be, the nature of the gag requires him to give you this sense of disorientation as you're looking for something, and it's it's on this difficult terrain, and and I I, I love that drawing of Snoopy in panel five. It's it's so. Yeah. No, it's not Schultz. It's so unique. <laughs> I would bet every everything I own. So about a dollar eighty five. That is definitely it's somebody I also, monkeyed with that panel. I also I'm love sure panel four. Yeah. I've never quite seen this before, where Snoopy is looking one direction and his his little leg is going off in in a different angle, like he's kind of he's like a bow legged, really charming drawing of snoopy in his frustration looking for this the other thing about this strip that that is kind of odd that that again schultz does sometimes do is he he goes for something that's very implausible i'm assuming the way linus is holding the contact lenses in the the panel that follows that somehow snoopy has lost both contact lenses in right. exactly the same space which is like I guess there's a there's a scenario where that would happen, but either it was a case, and then he would be he wouldn't be holding him like that. He would have found a case of but, contact lenses, or the contact lenses did they both fall out of Snoopy's eyes in exactly the same spot right next to each other? None of that matters. What matters <laughs> is the fact that either Schultz was sick <laughs> and had a okay. deadline. Yes, or... I think it's rushed. I th- that's what I I think that's the answer. It's rushed. That's, I mean, I know fatigue on the pages when I just don't feel like it, you know, where it's just, I have to get it done and I'm going to do the best I can. It's an ungodly amount of work he's doing. We are now leading up to him getting involved in the TV thing, probably possibly already negotiating that stuff, whatever. Yeah. I think it's fatigue. It's weird drawings. Um, I would disagree. But it's definitely Schultz. I disagree because I, I think this He's pushing himself in this strip to go places he normally doesn't go because of the nature of the gag. And he's trying to serve. Well, that is true. And so we're seeing angles you don't see. We're seeing we're seeing uh, landscapes you don't normally see. And so he's in, well, he's inventing a lot in the strip that we've never yeah, seen but before. It's always and beautiful. It and panel, yeah, well, panel five is ugly. I, I, <laughs> I like that drawing of, of Snoopy. It's a, it's an unusual drawing. One, but it, isn't it true to like the emotion of where what he would be thinking? I think the scribble on his paw is odd, it, which is, you know, Snoopy looking in the grass. I, I, you know, what we're basically saying is, boy, this guy every single time has to invent something completely I new, and he does perfection. it perfect. And he, and, <laughs> yeah, and this one time it's not maybe not perfect, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, they find the. Uh, contact lenses so all is right with the world <laughs> well i hope i didn't shock anyone too much with <laughs> i <laughs> Those are some on strong the allegations <laughs> Ms. My Cohen. lord april 3rd charlie brown's out in the pitcher's mound only this time it's covered in tiny little flowers he says to himself here we go the first pitch of the season he fires it in there and in panel three of course it is fired right back at him pow sending charlie brown flying and he lands flat on his back on top of the pitcher's mound and says to himself, it's kind of peaceful lying here among the dandelions. I remember th- these dandelion strips were epic. As a- I, for- I remember me this too. seemed like a yeah. huge sequence. Yeah, me too. The fact that dandelions grew all over the pitcher's mound is, is for some reason, again, one of those indelibly etched visuals that he's he's up against having dandelions on his pitcher's mound and how what a big deal that is you guys did not pick uh the best one though which is where 
Is it in this sequence? Do is that when Frida comes up and says, "Yes, Charlie Brown likes butter." <laughs> yes, that is the, the holds the little flower underneath Charlie yeah, Brown's chin adorable. and says, yeah. "Well, this will tell you if you like butter." And hey, everyone, Charlie Brown likes butter. And Charlie Brown says something like, "I wonder if my fondness for dairy products will help us win ball games." <laughs> <laughs> so great, so great. Speaking of great, I think this next strip, it would make my Hall of Fame peanut strips. Yeah. April 10th, Lucy and Linus are outside. Linus in classic thumb and blanket position. Lucy, classically looking annoyed. She says to Linus, our generation has been given the works. In panel two, she's ranting. All the world's problems are being shoved at us. Then Linus says, what do you think we should do? Then Lucy... (laughs) with a look of absolute sadism on her face and a clenched fist says, stick the next generation. Yeah. Now, mission accomplished, by the way, guys. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, these boomer kids. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no offense, but you guys are the worst. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, but the best comics. <laughs> For sure. And great music. Yeah. Uh, anyway, this is definitely a 60s strip. Cause yes. People were not talking about generations. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, did they? I mean, well, I mean, I think it was the kind of thing that certain anthropologists and people that were interested in that sort of thing uh, were interested in. But as a pop culture phenomenon, I mean, that starts with the baby boomers and the generation yeah, and, gap. Uh, and, I mean, there was the beat generation, the lost generation. People knew these things, but now it's like ubiquitous. Like, yeah. what's well, the, the beat generation, generation was not referring to that generation. It was re- referring to like maybe a hundred people in the world. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> but right. you know that my generation, the Who song came out this year, didn't it? Yes, yeah, nineteen sixty-five. Yeah, and that might have started that whole thing of like we're different than anything that's ever come before. Right. But stick it to the next generation. Stick the next generation is like yes. yeah, totally stick. true. And there's no exclamation, the next no exclamation point. So that, that makes yes. it even more ominous <laughs> for yes. some reason. And the look, as does the look on her face. I love this comic. That, I think this it, is it's, just it's an amazing and frightening and wonderful <laughs> strip. I mean, and, and again, the lettering is using that new pen point and it looks like he doesn't quite have the, the, the feel for how much you can stick in that space using yeah. the term stick again. But because, you know, you, if he's not ruling this stuff out, he's just kind of have to, has to wing it and he's a little bit tight on <laughs> in fitting those yeah, letters generation. in but um yeah this this is this strip is is again super super memorable it's a yeah and and seeing linus's little raised arms like he's <laughs> he, he, there's no expression <laughs> on his face but you can tell that he's he's really uh, he's set set back by by the intensity yeah. of, of and the blanket is also set back. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's ready to spring again. <laughs> really funny. This strip reminds me of as a kid growing up in the you know in the early 70s when you you'd get comic books they would often have ads for posters or patches that you oh, could yeah. get from like the the hippie generation they were like three or four years old and <laughs> but they right. were still selling the designs and it, it just reminds me of some of those kind of pseudo underground images you know the and uh the one that i think of here is is do unto others then split <laughs> <laughs> i have not thought about that in 40 years <laughs> Split. I love the fact that well, we'll we'll have a, a go go showing up in a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's always strange when you get those moments where he starts bringing in some current uh, lingo. Yeah, the term "stick." I mean that that also you know makes you think of those those beatnik movies, <laughs> the juvenile yeah, yeah. Point films. You know, shiv and <laughs> yeah. You'd think it would be "stick it too," which is the way we'd say it now, but maybe yeah. he just didn't have room. It, it might be that. Be- but it works so oh, great. Gosh, it's, it's such a brilliant the next generation. It's so yeah. curt. I love it. <laughs> April 15th. Charlie Brown is at the psychiatric booth. Lucy is listening. He says to her, and also when I talk to people, I find that they don't really listen to me. Charlie Brown continues, but Lucy's gaze has now shifted off the panel. Right. Charlie Brown says, I find that I can't seem to hold a person's attention. When I talk to people, their minds sort of wander off and they stare into space and, and, and 
panel three, Lucy is still staring into space, not in the direction of Charlie Brown. In the last panel, Charlie Brown just rolls his eyes skyward and sighs. Siga. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> can you read that again? Or... <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> you're, you're no Charlie Brown. That's right. All right, so there is obviously a lot we need to talk about here in 1965. So I say let's uh, let's call it quits right here for part one, and then we'll come back uh, next week and we'll finish up 1965. In the meantime, if you want to uh, continue being a part of this Unpacking Peanuts community, there's lots of different ways you can do that. Uh, the first thing you could do is you could visit our website and you could sign up for the Great Peanuts Reread. That is unpackingpeanuts.com. That's where you can go uh, to vote for your favorite strip of the year. You can see who's right, me, Michael, or Harold. You can uh, tell us who you agree with. You can check out our store where you can buy books from us. There's now merchandise. You can actually buy an Unpacking Peanuts t-shirt or two, uh, which are really fun. And you can follow us on the social media if you like it. If you're one of these Gen Z kids who's always around on your phone, um, you know, liking and 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 subscribing or whatever you do on social media, you can follow us at uh, Unpack Peanuts on both Instagram and Twitter. And we'd also really just like if you have obviously if you have a chance and you want to go on Apple and give us a, a rating and a review, that would be hugely helpful. Another thing that would just be hugely helpful if you like this podcast and you want to see it continue and you want more people to be a part of this fun community just tell a friend share it with someone especially we have you know the great pumpkin episode we have a bunch of you know special standalone episodes with with guests i'm sure there's something in our our back catalog that can interest a friend of yours and if you have a moment uh, you know share share one of those episodes with them that would be hugely helpful to us i'm really grateful for all the the downloads we've gotten so far, all the comments and and questions and everything uh, from all you listeners out there. So I just want to see uh, that continue and, and see it continue to grow. Other than that, just come back next week where we're uh, going to continue with 1965. Until then, for Michael and Harold, I'm Jimmy. Be of good cheer. Yes, yes be of, be good, of cheer. good cheer. Unpacking Peanuts is copyright Jimmy Gownley, Michael Cohen, and Harold Buckholtz. Produced and edited by Liz Sumner. Music by Michael Cohen. Additional voiceover by Aziza Shakrala Clark. For more from the show, follow Unpack Peanuts on Instagram and Twitter. For more about Jimmy, Michael, and Harold, visit unpackingpeanuts.com. Have a wonderful day, and thanks for listening. Good work.